Brother Weldon Blake is the father of our originally scheduled speakers. We mentioned last night Brother Wayne Blake had some serious surgery about a week ago and is going to try to be here today, but he did not think he was up to delivering the lesson. And now we have our speaker this morning, who's Brother Bruce Stulting. He, of course, is uh, the preacher for the Fish Hatchery Road Congregation. And I pause here to uh, mention also how much we appreciate the Fish Hatchery elders and the preacher and the church for the stand for the truth that they take. Uh, we have a close relationship with them and they us, and we certainly appreciate their love for the truth. Bruce was born and brought up in Carnes City, Texas, a graduate of the Southwest School of Bible Studies back when I was there. And uh, so you can blame any problems he has on me. Uh, he likes to do that. He has uh, participated also in the graduate program some years ago, the Memphis School of Preaching, 98 through 2000. He's done local work in Kansas, Missouri, Arkansas. Now he's been working with the Fish Hatchery Road Congregation in Huntsville, Texas since 2001. And he also serves, I said, I think I said it, as one of the elders there. He has done uh, mission work in other countries, the Philippines and Cambodia, preaches in gospel meetings and speaks on several lectureships, has conducted uh, evangelistic campaigns in three states, Oklahoma, Kansas, and Missouri, and has worked with several uh, Bible camps, and he's still working with uh, one here that we all support or are involved in, in the Lone Star Camp. And by the way, when is that session this year? First week, First week in June? Second week in June. I'm sorry. We don't know, but just check and find out. It'll be sometimes this summer. Uh, I realize. Uh, listen, you don't know the trouble we had just trying to pry those dates out of Ken. Second week in June. Second, everybody got that? Just erase everything else you heard. We would love to have you uh, send children there and be a part of that. Second week in June. Uh, he's been involved in a number of things, and he has worked with us in the school here, and he also works for the Texas Department of Transportation. He's one of the few people in Huntsville that works for the state of Texas that doesn't work in the gated community. Um, well, I said that, but he's married to the former Sue Bemis of Corpus Christi, Texas, and that's a gated community enough. Um, she stands by him very well. We pick it, her. She's hiding right now behind somebody else's head. Uh, we we appreciate Sue so much and all the work that she does. And she's from Corpus Christi. They have three children, eleven grandchildren. And again, we commend their life and work for the Lord to everybody. We appreciate their support, and I count him a near and dear friend. And I want to encourage him to continue to be faithful in all things as we try to help each other to do that. He'll be speaking on dishonesty. And that means what I just said had to be an honest statement. So 40 minutes, you come up in five. That means I have 45 minutes. According to the homeschool math. Right? Dishonesty. You know, a lot of times when we think about honesty or dishonesty, our mind automatically goes to whether or not we tell the truth or we lie. But honesty is much more than telling the truth. It has to do with really who and what you are. It comes from the French word from which we get honor and honorable. And an honorable person is going to be honest in all areas of their life. Not only will they speak the truth, but they will do the truth. Their actions and their words go together. They won't say one thing and do another. They will always tell the truth and they will always live by principles of morality. And that's what we've been talking about last night, uh, a lesson on, on the source of morality and morality in the government uh, and, and, and those things. And certainly, if we are going to be a moral people, we need to be an honest people. 
If you look at uh, Exodus chapter 20, turn there with me. And um, we have <clears throat> the Ten Commandments, what we come to call the Ten Commandments. It starts out, and God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which has brought thee out of uh, the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven uh, image or any uh, likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. And he goes on, Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them, for I am the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that uh, hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and uh, do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. Uh, <clears throat> in it thou shalt not uh, do any work, Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, thy maidservants, nor that cattle, for the, uh, nor the stranger that is within uh, thy gates. For in six days the Lord has made heaven and earth, and uh, uh, the sea, and all that is in them is. And uh, the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath, Day and hallowed it. And now notice verse 12. Honor thy father and mother. Notice that honor thy father. Honor this idea of honesty begins at home. I don't understand the, the word honor there talks about care for your parents in their old age. That's the idea there. But honor thy father and mother that thy days may be what? Long upon the land which the Lord thy God uh, giveth thee, thou shalt what? Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's house, and so forth. Notice those last commandments. Some of those deal with our relationship with God. The others deal with our relationship with man. And certainly those last commandments would, cert, would, would come under the idea of honesty. Think of how great the world would be, our country in particular, and especially the Lord's church. And then we can apply this same principle to the home and to the workplace. If everybody was honest and treated everyone honestly in all things. Think what, what our nation would be like if our elected officials would actually do the things they said to us when we elected them. I remember the, the movie, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, Jimmy Stewart, of course, playing a lawyer in that movie, is holding a class for some of the townspeople, teaching them to read. And he's teaching them principles about the Constitution and about the government. And he asked them to define... Uh, a, Democrat, a democratic government, a republic. And one of the little old ladies in the class said, well, that means that we vote people into office, and if they don't do what we say, we don't vote for them, by golly, no more. And uh, that's, that, that we live in a country where if we have public officials who lie to us, we have the right, the power and the obligation to hold them to what they've said. And if we prove them to be dishonest, why do we keep electing them? Why do we keep appointing those people to those positions that have such control over our freedom and our liberty who are liars and cheats? 
They will tell you what you want to hear and then go out and do whatever promotes their agenda when they get into office. You see, that's dishonest. The Bible has a lot to say about rulers, and, and Dub covered that last night, and about the obligation that they have to protect our freedom, to protect our liberty, to guard our uh, right to live and to exist in this community. They should be ministers of God for good. And they should uphold the righteous. And they should cast down the wicked. But we see that in reverse now, don't we? We see that happening all the time. Our public officials have a very liberal agenda. They have a very, uh, uh, I guess, immoral agenda. Because they're promoting things like abortion, same-sex marriage. Which in reality, if you poll the country, the majority of the people are against. But it seems that whoever speaks the loudest and the longest gets heard, right? Maybe we need to be speaking louder and longer so that we can be heard. You know, the, generally speaking, the, the minority that is vocal, generally gets their way. We call it the squeaky wheel, right? Gets the grease. Yeah, sometimes that's the way it is. But we need to hold to what they say they're going to do. When we think about the law of rationality, if you study philosophy and things like that, the law of rationality, if you're going to be a rational person, then you need to support your beliefs with adequate evidence. But we've developed a culture in our society where anybody can say anything, whether it's right or wrong, and, and then if somebody challenges them on it, then they're the bad guy. You see, we can say anything we want, and that goes back to what Michael was saying on the idea of the source of ethics. If my source of ethics is subjectivism, then whatever I believe is the truth is the truth, even if it disagrees with what you believe is the truth. I'm, I'm right and you're right, and we could be saying the exact opposite from one another. How is that honest? How is that system of morality honest? And what basis in reality does it have? But yet that's where we are in our country, in our society. Everybody's doing what's right in their own eyes. We think about this idea. God wants us to be honest. He wants us to be trustworthy. We think about honesty. We, have, we need to be honest in our responsibilities. Leviticus 19, beginning in verse 11. You shall not steal, neither deal falsely. Neither lie one to another, and ye shall not swear by the name by thy name or by my name falsely, neither shall thou profane the name of thy God, I am the Lord, thou shalt not defraud thy neighbor, neither rob him. The wages of him that is hired shall shall not abide with thee all night until the morning. Notice the, the honesty in which we're supposed to relate to those around us. It has things to do with, with our neighbor. Don't lie. Don't defraud your neighbor. Don't hold back his wages, even for one night. If he works and you get you pay him by the day, then don't hold back his wages until the next day. That's all talking about honor among our associations and being honorable. Psalm 15, beginning in verse 1. Who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walks uprightly and walks righteous, worketh righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not it with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up reproach against his neighbor, in whose eyes a vile person is condemned, but he honors them that fear the Lord. He that swears to his own hurt and changes not. That's honesty. 
I make a deal. I was, you know, Doug was talking about those people who are 50 and older can remember a day when morality meant something in our country. And homosexuality was talked about in hushed, quiet tones, and it wasn't uh, open to public discussion or even public debate because everybody understood it was wrong. It was against the law. Well, I'm over 50. And uh, don't tell anybody, but I'm over 50. I have to be honest now uh, in this lesson. But I remember those days. I remember the day when you could strike a deal for multiple thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars, and shake hands on it. And you didn't have to have a big Philadelphia lawyer come along and have to write out a thousand-page contract full of loopholes so that you can get out of the contract later. But yet that's where we are today. What happened to the day when a man's word was his bond? When people said what they meant and meant what they said. And if they said they were going to do something and, and they gave the assurance that they were going to do it, if it turned out that it wasn't going to be in their favor, they did it anyway. Where's that kind of integrity today? You know, I took my, my truck in one time to the auto mechanic and I said, well, you know, it doesn't start all the time. And so they changed the switch on the starter. He said, okay, that's, it's fixed. So I took it home, and next day, guess what? It wouldn't start. So I took it back, and I said, I thought you fixed this. He said, we did. And I said, well, it's still doing the same thing. And he said, oh, it must be something else. No, this is the same thing it was doing. You just changed the part, and it didn't fix the problem. Now are you going to man up and, and fix my truck right this time? And, and, and let's talk about the payment on this. I paid you to put a part on my truck that it didn't need. Oh, yeah, it needed that part. You see, there's a difference between a mechanic and a parts changer. And I went to a parts changer. You know, if you change enough parts on a vehicle, sooner or later you're going to get to the one that's bad. And you're going to say, hey, I fixed it. Right? Where's the day when you could take your car in and the guy would keep it until it was fixed? And if he put the wrong part on, then that was out of his pocket. I remember those days. But not anymore. Not anymore. We need to be honest in our dealings with people. You know, we have a whole uh, department in our government that goes around and checks gas pumps and scales and the, you know, you go to the, the grocery store and you're going to buy some bananas and you put them in that little basket and the little needle goes around. Well, there's somebody who goes around and makes sure that scale's accurate, you know. Why do we need a whole branch of government that's set up to go and make sure our scales are accurate, our pumps at the gas station are accurate? You know why we need that? Because somewhere, some along the way, somebody began cheating people by fixing the scales. And the Bible deals with that. In Leviticus 19, verse 35, Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment, in meat yard, in weight, or in measure. Just balance, just weights, a just ephah, and a just ten shall ye have. I am the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of, of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe all my statutes and all my judgment, and do them. I am the Lord. There's no doubt that we live in a wicked and perverse nation, as Peter described in Acts chapter 2. And because of that, there are dishonest people that are by hook or crook going to try to take advantage of whoever they deal with. And so dishonesty, yeah, there, it's, it's all around us. But the Christian needs to be different than that. When people look at the Christian, they need to be able to say, there's a man or a woman that's different than the rest of the world. And that's all part of, of being being a Christian, being like Christ, having the mind of Christ. 
We're encouraged in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Be not conformed to the world, but be ye transformed. See, if we're conformed to the world, then it would be natural for us to be dishonest. Because that's what the world is. We live in a world where people are dishonest. Where people try to take advantage of, of the gullible. Right? Never let your wife take the car to the auto mechanic. Right? Why do I say that? Because it's proven by documentaries, research, that if a woman takes a car to the auto mechanic, they're going to lie to her and sell her stuff she doesn't need. You take that same car to the same mechanic with a guy taking it in, and they won't do that. They may do it, but not to the degree they'll do it with a woman. That's the kind of world we live in. You know, Jesus said that Satan was a liar from the beginning. And that brought up, in my mind, a legitimate question. Is a person a liar because he tells a lie, or does he tell a lie because he's a liar? It's kind of a chicken and egg thing, right? But I believe somebody tells a lie because they're a liar. And the reason I say that is because you have to convince yourself in your mind that I'm going to become, I'm going to be dishonest. And then you tell the lie. I become a liar in my mind. And then I speak the lie. Liars are, are people that lie do so because they're liars. And, that, and that's the way it is. You know, Satan, Satan originated the thing. He deceived. He deceived Eve. He lied about God, His Word, His integrity. He lied about all those things. To deceive Eve into eating that forbidden fruit so that she would deceive her husband and he would eat and sin would enter the world. You see, that's the origin of dishonesty. That's why Jesus said, you are of your father the devil. Dishonest people are of their father the devil. It's that simple. That's how serious this is. You know, I said... A while ago, we need to say what we mean and mean what we say. Words have meaning. Every properly stated proposition is either true or false. And yet we have people that will blurt out anything that comes to their mind and never give any thought to whether it's true or even what they're saying. And then when somebody comes along and questions them about it and holds their feet to the fire and they become uncomfortable, they don't like it. And this attitude has even entered the pulpit of the Lord's church. I can preach anything and say anything from the pulpit and you don't have a right to question me. See, that sounds like politics, doesn't it? Doesn't that sound... There's so many parallels between the pulpit and politics that it's not even funny. Liberalism in, in politics and liberalism in the church, what's the difference? There's so many similarities there. But this pulpit should never be uh, filled based on politics. It ought to be filled based on the truthfulness and the honesty of the man standing behind it. But yet we have so many in the Lord's church today that will talk a good talk and they'll say all the right things. But then they turn around and live however they want. And then when you question them about it, we have people teaching the truth on fellowship and then they extend uh, fellowship to false teachers. Or they extend fellowship to those that support false teachers. And this has been a hotly debated issue for, for a decade now. And, and more, but more, but, but more 
personally for the last 10 or so years. We have people that sign a letter of support for apologetics press. And when they're questioned about it, you have Dave Miller. He's going to be the, the director. Well, we didn't know that when we signed it. That implies to me, had they known that he was going to be the director, they wouldn't have signed it. Am I, is that unreasonable? But were they honest in that? Did they retract their name from that list? If they were honest, and that was a true statement, then they would have took their name off the list. I know several men on that list, if they would have been honest, and stood up for the truth and lived what they preached and went back and said, look, we made a mistake. We were wrong. But see, we don't want to say we're wrong. That's the problem. If we do something that's wrong, own up to it. Say, I made the mistake. I did something wrong. This is the right thing to do. They know it's the right thing to do because they preach it. But again, it's one thing to say something. Remember, it's not always about telling a lie, is it? You can preach the truth, but live the lie. And that's where we are in the Lord's church today. And by the way, the Internet's an amazing thing. I love the Internet. I use it quite often. But it's also a dangerous thing. Do you realize that what you put on the Internet is there? It's there, folks. You, can't, you might delete it, but it's still there. Somebody, if they want to, they can find it. Right? Then we have all this social media. People getting on there and... And they're, and they're talking about movies, they're talking about songs, they're talking about this, they're talking about that, they talk about social issues and, and things like that. That's there, folks. And when we make a statement on the Internet that the world can see, you better make sure that what you say is right. Because if you don't, you could lead somebody else astray. I think the Internet could be a good thing. can be a source of, of, of uh, evangelism to instruct the world in the ways of righteousness. But we need to be careful <laughs> in, in what we do and how we do it. And make sure that what we say is right. Remember, what we say about the law of rationality... Support your beliefs with adequate evidence. In debate, it's a fallacy in debate to offer truth about a proposition that supports the proposition and then ignore other truth that may be contrary to that proposition. But yet that's what we have a lot of times. People, uh, the, the Baptists are doing. Those people that teach grace only or faith only salvation, how do they study the Bible? Well, they make up in their mind that we're saved by grace. Then they go to the Bible. They find verses that seem to support that. And they say, see here, they conclude. Here's all these verses say we're saved by grace. And they conclude, grace only. The Bible talks about some people that are willfully ignorant. Yeah. The Bible talks about people that deceive. Paul talks to Timothy in his second epistle about those that deceive and are being deceived. It seems like that's the culture we live in, doesn't it? I'm deceiving you and, and you're deceiving me and, and I expect that from you and you expect it from me and I need to watch out for myself and you watch out for yourself. Whatever promotes me. Is that an honest way to go through life? Is it really? No. The Bible talks about people that rest the Scriptures to their own destruction. Romans chapter 1 says that there are those that did not like to retain God in their knowledge. 
You know, that's an interesting verse right there. Especially the word like. Where it says they did not like to retain God in their knowledge and, and He gave them up to a reprobate mind. The word like there means that they rejected the evidence from their mind. They didn't consider the evidence that God has provided. In fact, in the, the verses preceding that, it talks about the fact that God's given us evidence. That we're without excuse if we don't come to the conclusion that God exists. But yet some people rejected that evidence. And didn't reason about it. And then we come down to the word reprobate. He gave them over to a reprobate. You know what the word reprobate means? It doesn't mean what you think. It basically means that your mind doesn't function the way it should. Their mind didn't function the way it should because they rejected the evidence. They weren't honest with the truth. And I believe that the church is suffering because people are in this same situation. They do not like to retain God in their knowledge. They do it as long as it's convenient. As long as things are going my way, I'm going to follow Christ. Is that an honest approach to Christianity? No. The Hebrew writers, chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, had yeah, that great chapter 11 on, on heroes of the faith. People that, that lived what they believed. These were honest men and women that not only believed what God said, but they did what God said. That's the true nature of faith. That's a, that's a description of an honest person. Here's what God said, and, and whatever He says, I'm going to do. And then in chapter 12, He begins the application. Seeing we're compassed about by so great cloud of witnesses, let us run with patience the race that is set before us. How do we run that race? Well, He tells us. Laying aside the weight and the sin that does so easily beset us, then we can run that race. Lay aside the weight and the sin. Notice, the weight and the sin. There are some things that are sinful that will hinder my race. And we understand that. If it's sin, it's, I'm not going to be able to follow Christ. I'm not going to be able to run my race. I'm not going to get to heaven. But he's also saying there's weights. There are things that are not necessarily sinful that can still hinder my following Christ. I need to get those out of the way. I need to lay those aside so that I can fix my eyes on Jesus who's the author and, and finisher of my faith. Yeah. It takes honesty to do that. In the parable of the sower in Luke chapter 8, the seed is the Word of God, verse 11. And Jesus talks about different types of soil. How many different types of soil were there? Before you say four, think again. There's two types of soil. There's good soil and there's bad soil. There's three types of bad soil and one type of good soil. But the good soil, how is that good soil described? We're talking about the heart. The good soil is described as a good and honest heart. A good and honest heart. An honest heart is going to come to the Bible and he's going to search for the will of God. He's not going to try to make up his mind what God wants him to do and then go try to find verses that seem to support that. He's going to go to the Bible and he's going to search the Scriptures. He's going to study and show himself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth. If that doesn't scream honesty, I don't know what does. We need to be honest when we go to the Bible. And have the idea that whatever the Bible says for me to do, I'm going to do it. Wherever the Bible leads me, that's where I'm going to go. 
That's an honest approach to Bible study. I don't care the cost to me personally. I'm going to do what God says. Some people who are dishonest with the Scriptures give up when the going gets tough. When it begins to cost them financially, they compromise. When it begins to to interrupt their family association, they compromise. How many people have compromised on their belief in marriage, divorce, and remarriage because they have a family member that's in an unscriptural marriage? How is that honest? Oh, I've got to rethink this. I have, to, I have to reconsider this. Well, what are they doing? Well, they're reconsidering it until they can come up with some reason to justify an unscriptural marriage. They can't do it from the Bible, and so there's the compromise. I compromise sometimes because of my job. How many pre- preachers have compromised the truth for a pre- paycheck? How many preachers have quit preaching the truth to keep a page? How is that honest? How many people will forsake the assembly to go on vacation? You know, some people think when they go on vacation, they're on vacation from the Lord too. You know what I really like to see be be, be at a congregation and somebody's passing through on Sunday and they take time to look for a congregation that they can go worship with. See, that's an honest person. They could have been away from the home congregation. No one's the wiser. Out of sight, out of mind. When the cat's away, the the mouse will play or whatever. How are you going to look at it? Do what you want. It's vacation. How many people try to justify immodest apparel when they go miss swimming? How many people promote their children to go out and be cheerleaders when the very practice of cheerleading has become immodest in its dress, immodest in what they do, but yet we still have people that promote their children doing those things. And then when you try to go to the Bible and and, and say, look what the Bible says about modest apparel and indecent movements and, and things like that, dancing, They compromise the truth. You see, they're true to the book until what? Until it's personal. Until it's something they have to give up. Were they ever honest? Were those people ever honest with the Scriptures? If they were just going along as as long as the Bible went along with them? See, they have it backward. We need to go along with the Bible. Not expect the Bible to go along with us. We need to follow Jesus wherever He leads. Even if it means we have to give up. Even if it means we have to sacrifice. What do you think Jesus meant when He said, If any man will follow Me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow Me. What what does it mean, take up your cross there? Some people say, oh, that just means endure hardships that come along in life. Well, it may be it. maybe some of it. But when Jesus took up the cross, what did it mean for Him? Jesus went to the cross and died. When I take up my cross, I need to die to myself. I need to die to sin. I need to die to the world. And I need to live for Christ. That's an honest approach to Christian living. No longer putting myself first, but putting Christ first. Even if it costs me persecution. If I have to give up a job. If I have to lose friends. Even if my family turns on me. I have to stay true to the book. I have to be honest with the Scriptures. Because if I ever compromise, there's one less person living in a world to demonstrate to the world that God's way is the best way. Romans 12, mentioned that a while ago, verse 1. 
and 2. Be not conformed to the world. Don't pattern yourself after the world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why, Paul? Why do we need to do that? That you may prove. Who are we proving this to? To God? No, God already knows. We're proving this to the world. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. By living an honest life and, and treating the Scriptures with respect the way we should, we're an example. Jesus said, let your light shine before men. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let your light shine. Can I let my light shine if I'm dishonest and deceitful? Untrustworthy? No. I need to live in this world as an honest person. So that I not only can save myself, but I might have an influence for good on those in the community. Remember, if you become dishonest, if you're a liar, if you're untrustworthy, a deceiver, then you've hurt your reputation and you can no longer be effective for the cause of Christ. Maintain your integrity at all costs. A good name is better to be had than silver and gold. Thank you for your time. Brother Stelting has got this day off to a fine start in the lectures. You think about what he said in bringing out the truth of God's Word and applying it to various situations. And if that were believed and applied by most of this nation, it would change so many things from the individual to husbands and wives to parents and children, the school systems, the government, industry, and so on. Honesty is just the only way to go. The old adage is honesty is the best policy. I must tell you this, it came to mind, Bruce may remember this, I think he was still in school. I had a call when I was still director of the school over at uh, Southwest. It was from an elder, and I forgot where he was from now. But they had a young man, he was married, and um, evidently his wife was pretty faithful from his testimony. This young man was lacking in a lot of formal education. And uh, he had just been converted. And uh, from the perspective of some elders regarding a preacher training school, you know, it's uh, a place to come and get people to be Christians, which is not the truth. <laughs> Higher standard than that is to be able to be prepared to come and do what ought to be done there in view of why it exists. And I said, well, we normally don't take people who are on that level of things. He said, well, I think he can do very well. I think he would make a preacher. He says he wants to be, and he said, I think being there for a couple of years would just really turn him around. He said, there is one problem. He said, he smokes like a smokestack. I said, well, that ends it. He can't come and have that kind of addiction. Well, it was about four months before the next session started. And <clears throat> he kept him hawing around. I said, he's not going to come for that if he can't get out that out of his system. That will be his first test. Can he get this out of his system in the next four months to where he does not smoke anymore? Period. That's it. Okay. We'll do that. And he agreed to support this fellow. So he comes, and uh, he's there the first, uh, what have we had, the end quarter semester, whatever it was. And I start getting a little whiff. You know, people that smoke, you can smell it. You can really smell it on, on the clothes. And they may not smell it, but... We do. So I began to wonder. Just kept listening. So it got so bad, I called him in the office one day. And I said, now you know that you are not going to be allowed to come here if you didn't give up your smoking. And I said, you know as well as I do, you are smoking. And I, I said, you know people know it. You know it's a bad example. You know for what you're wanting to be, it's not good. And now here you are under false pretenses because you knew you couldn't come and smoke and be here. And I said, just think of what kind of example that is to other people. I said, they see that, and it's not, not a good example at all. He said, yeah, but that's uh, 
that's not a, a real bad thing. He said, I don't do it out. I said, I can spend it on you. And uh, he said, that, I said, that's enough. And besides that, the integrity part of it, you, you've already broken that in your life, your dishonesty. I said, besides all that, God knows it whether anybody else here knows it. Now, this is a clincher, folks. Talking about dog eating your homework. He said, yeah, God knows it, but he's not going to tell anybody. I said, I looked at him for a minute, and I said, uh, go get your books and clean out everything, and this is the last uh, day you'll be here, and you need to go on home. Uh, there were several things wrong with that, but now when somebody preparing to be a preacher, said, well, there must be others out there that take that position. I can do this, and you don't know it, and God's not going to tell anybody even though he knows it. Well, thank you very much for that lesson on honesty. We hope everybody will take it to heart because it's as fundamental a matter in godly living as anything I can think of. And you won't become a Christian without an honest and good heart, and you won't be faithful throughout your life without an honest and good heart. We stand dismissed for about the next 10 minutes, and then we'll come for our next session. Thank you. <laughs>